another conversation here with Motor Age. I'm Shannon Brandyberry, and I am managing editor of Motor Age magazine. Today we are talking with Chris Chevy Frederick, who is the ATI founder and CEO, and Brian Stosh, who is vice president of client fulfillment. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about customer service. Um, you know, better ways to get your service advisors, your service writers, your service managers to talk more like a professional so people treat you like the professionals that you are. So first off, gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to today's conversation. Thank you. Hi, Shannon. Thanks for having us. It's no problem. All right, to get started, first let's talk about customer service is more than just setting someone up for an appointment. Can you explain a little why um, working with a customer is more like building a relationship with them? Sure. Um, actually, very easy one. Um, and we, we here at ATI preach that we are in a relationship business today, not a transactional sales business. And this is probably going to be more prevalent today forward than ever before. Um, it is imperative that we create the relationships with clients um, because we need the visits per year. We need them talking about us because marketing will be harder than ever. Um, and this is really like a relationship because we have a lot to learn about customers, them about us, and probably some give and take. Um, like most relationships, um, writers have to learn expectations of customers. They have to learn what do they use the vehicle for. They have to learn um, what's the emotional attachment to the car, which helps us relate better to them and when providing services or offering services or presenting services. Um, with the give and take, um, again, we have a lot to learn. They have a lot to learn about us. It can't be all about us, thus the give, because we are asking for their hard-earned cash. We have to make sure that if a time a customer is wrong for any reason, um, we make them feel that that's okay. They don't know this. It's okay for us to, to teach them things about our business. We can't um, when they're wrong, we can't drive that point home. We can make fun of Just acknowledge that, okay, here's the way maybe it should be or the way it is. Um, but relationships are, my gosh, so imperative from every step of the process, every step of the workflow process, in between services, just because we need them so much, and they do need us. You want to add anything to that? Well, I think the, uh, the, the, the big picture is, uh, customers don't really care how much you know about their car until they know how much you care about them. Uh, they, they, they really, well, before you can even begin uh, to teach them everything that's right or wrong with their car and try to help them, they, they truly got to know you care about them. And, and you can't just say it. It takes time. It takes time getting to know them, using their name the way they give it, and, uh, so that there's trust. And, and the whole key about, you know, selling anything and, uh, that's what we're doing in this case is, is trust. So, and that takes time to build. And something else most need to remember. Um, a lot of writers spend so much time focused on the car. Um, they have to remember that the car doesn't care where it goes. They have to spend the time focusing on learning about the customer. That's all really true because I, I want you to know that I'm, you're, I am there because you are running a business, but I don't want you to treat me like I'm just another you know, check coming in pay the bills. Right. Good way to put it. And it happens because, uh, you know, shop owners uh, are having a much bigger challenge today trying to make profit than they were 10, 15, 20 years ago. It was a lot easier. So there's a lot of pressure on service advisors to produce billable hours and, uh, uh, and hit the key performance indicators. So you do that. And it's really easy to kind of lose sight that there's a human being in the middle of all this equation. Huh. And something I did forget. Um, and Chubby uh, led to it about the gaining confidence and gaining trust of that customer because we are talking about a lot of services that they're hearing a bunch of third-party information that's inaccurate for the customer. So the customer's stuck in the middle not really knowing what to do and do need a good service provider they can trust and count. Absolutely, absolutely. So building on that relationship, you know, you want customers, both current and potential, to realize that you're a professional and you want to be treated like one, like how they would treat other professionals, such as their doctor, their dentist, lawyer. How can service writers or the owners even make sure that they convey a, uh, a message of professionalism to their customers? All right. Well, 
I'd say let's first start with their appearance and how they carry themselves. Um, do they dress like the pro? A clean professional uniform and a clean image, not just whatever they threw on that day. Do they look like a team? Do they look like they care? Um, do they act like pros? Um, good posture and body language, confident, maintaining eye contact with the customers. Do they say or they do they do what they say they're going to do, and do they follow through? Do they take charge and do they lead the customer through this process? And an example I always like to use about being the pro is when customers calling asking about a price or asking about tires, whatever it is, mm -hmm. and they're too busy asking the customer, well, what's about this? What about that? The writers are the pro. They should know this. They have tools to look this kind of information up based off a of year making model. So be the pro. Um, do they talk like the pro? Um, do they speak clearly? Do they talk to the customer and not at them? Are they asking questions and getting the customer involved? Do they stay away from industry lingo and bad words, profanity? Um, customers have no idea what toast means or burnt means. Be the professional. Um, proper greetings, and I think Chubby already hit on that. And do they really know what they're talking about? Um, are they trying to make this up as they go through? And then, of course, I'm going to ask them, are they the pro? And what I mean by that is how much time or practice or research do they really put into their careers? Are they, are they learning about particular things? And not um, features and benefits, but I use this in a classroom all the time about the extended life fluids and things of that nature poor consumers are hearing about from the dealers, from the manufacturers, yada, yada, yada. Are they doing the homework to really see what happens? And there's tons um, of articles and technical service bulletins on what that really happened or what really happens in those. So are they walking and talking and acting like the pro? Are they being the pro? But I still think most importantly, do they know what being the pro really looks like? Do they have any type of barometer to see what that service experience should be? What do you want to add to that? <laughs> it's hard to add anything to that. But the challenge I would think uh, for everyone is this is an easier thing to do when the shop is running smoothly and it's not swamped and weeded with cars and having a busy day. I think where most of these things fall apart is when a shop just gets overweeded with cars. Um, happens a lot in the summer. Uh, yeah. A lot of owners just love stacking the cars right and left. Uh, and, and many owners still today believe that uh, the more cars they bring in, the more money they'll make. But every shop has a sweet spot. And that sweet spot may be eight cars a day. It may be 22 cars a day. But if you exceed it, uh, then the service advisor, even if he wants to be a professional, he doesn't have the time to do what he needs to do because he's too busy just taking orders. And he's trying to get the cars through. So this is an easy thing to do when things are calm. It's a difficult thing to do when the shop is under stress. You just said something also very important there, Chubb, is that they care. Um, it's funny, we bring in 50, 60 service advisors a month through our training classes here. And one of the things Randy does is talk about attitude or skill. It's funny that most of the role of a service writer is more about attitude and caring, about wanting to do the right thing versus necessarily skill. So. Yeah. Okay. Let's tie that into some more about how they can then implement this. I mean, you said they need to know, they need to care, they need to use the proper vocabulary, they need to have the proper appearance. So. While you don't want to use phrases um, like your example that you wrote about in a recent Profit Matters that appeared in the magazine, you know, you don't want to throw on a water pump, how do you walk the line of not talking over a customer's head or not, like you said, not talking at a customer? They don't want to feel like they're being taken advantage of. Uh, good one. Very good one. And this actually that um, kind of comes at you several fold here. Well, let's pick on two. Um, I'd be more, like the term, throw on a water pump. I'd be more concerned about devaluing my service. And as a service writer, I spent 18 years of my career writing service, and I had a horrible mistake of making a statement of, we'll just hook it up to the box and see what the box tells us. We bought a bunch of engine analyzers from Trump Chubby back in the day, and it made life very easy. Pull in, you got this big box, you plug it in. Customer come in with the check engine light, drivability complaint, 
And yeah, that's all right. I'm going to go ahead and hook it up to the box and let's see what the box tells us. But in the meantime, I need $96 to figure that out. I just crushed the value yeah. by saying hook it up to the box. And not only from the value thing, but we do use a lot of fear words um, to either devalue our service or make customers fear we're over talking, that we're talking over them. So you could pick on things like the technical stuff um, and be very, very careful of using two technical terms. It's okay to use a technical term, but once done, break that down into layman terms that customers truly understand. Talk in their language. So I used to like to find out what my customers did for a living because it was easy to relate what I'm doing to something that they do for a living. Layman's terms, don't talk over their head. Um, be careful of words you use to devalue your service, but again, I picked it, I mentioned the industry lingo like toast, burnt, and stuff like that. I don't think that's good, and we do have a list of uh, 13 different fear words if you'd like us to review them with you while we have you here. That'd be great. All right, first one I'd be very careful of is the word need, and the example we always like to use is when do you need a belt? You need a belt when it's broken. Prior to that, you recommend a belt. Again, tear down. Tear down isn't the best word. Disassemble for inspection or disassemble and in, or review. Be careful of ripped apart. Um, again, what does that customer think you're doing to the car when you use things like ripped apart or cheaper or check it out? Check it out. What does that mean? And how do you justify asking for diagnostics? Cheap, cheaper is the one I hate. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> We're gonna, we'll get you a cheaper part, or, or uh, this will be cheaper than uh, doing it this way. That's, uh, so how about like lesser expensive? Yeah. Now you've just told them you're putting on cheap parts. So good one. Yeah. But we think the problem is, you should know. Remember, be the professional. I can't do this or that. If you can't, share with them why, or I can do this. Um, honestly... You know, when you talk to someone, they keep saying, well, honestly, well, I'll tell you the truth. What's that typically tell you? Um, so they been lying, right? All over front of that. Right? Oh, my gosh, yes. <laughs> Everything else you said was a mess. I don't know. Let me find out for you. It's a better word. Uh-huh. The Great. ends and the ums while talking and the ends and the ums in between conversations. I'm going to tell you, just be prepared. Um, another bad one is we'll take a look. Not good. And along with, we'll plug it into the machine, as I just mentioned. It's perform a diagnostic process or a diagnostic test or a diagnostic, or diagnostic series. And here's one that I really hate. If I was you, oh, you're not them. Do not try to put yourself in those shoes. You are from a different perspective. You're in the automotive repair and service. So it's easy for you to decide. So remember, you're not them. So there's the basic ones that we teach in a class, as well as the industry lingo, some of the fear words like sign here. I just need an autograph. Or okay the paperwork. Exactly. Yeah. Just yeah. trying to keep things a little light when it comes to that kind of stuff. One of the ones that drives me crazy, Shannon, is uh, I'll hear service advisors say, you know, we sell an awful lot of maintenance here at Yada Yada Auto Repair or or we get people buy maintenance all the time. I, I think buy and sell are bad words because we teach them to say invest. Most of our clients invest in auto maintenance. Uh, the reason I would suggest that you invest in maintaining your car is because yada yada yada, it'll be cheaper than having a break. I said cheaper than not. See, this isn't easy. It's this isn't easy. easy. Yeah. And I, and Chubby mentioned the word sell. And, and I hated this. I'd be at the counter talking to a customer. And a technician poke their head and say, hey, did you sell my ticket yet? Oh, that kind of stuff stays behind closed doors. You wait, but getting approval or authorization looks much better or sounds better, at least from a customer's ears, because now the customer feels they had a choice, not they're being sold something. That's a great point and something that, you know, once a service advisor or service writer learns these tricks, they, they can and should then share with their technicians just, you know, kind of keep this in mind if you're coming out front. I know you have a lot to keep, you know, a lot to know, a lot of, of other things that you're keeping front of mind, but remember, we're out here trying to help you, and we can't, you know, get you that car if you're going to be undermining us in these ways. Yeah, it's tough. Well, you can see I couldn't even do it. 
Well, we have this restaurant down the street. I spend more time, I think, in restaurants than on the counter at my age these days. Brian's the other way around. But uh, this 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 uh, a waiter we have, he always he's always saying to me, Chubby, I sold eight of these entrees today, or I sold six of these today. I'm like, dude, I don't care how many you sold. How how is it? Would you tell me how the food is? I don't care how many we sold. So, and I think it's it's easy to use those those dirty words. It and, uh, you just don't think about it. You don't you don't think about the impact it has on somebody. Oh yeah, and I mean, in some cases you're breaking years and years or decades of habits here. So decades, and that's why you know we've always believed, and we see it with our clients. Our average client stays with us five years, and we recommend an annual tune-up on the service advisor of four to six days a year. And, you know, it, it seems silly because many of them are doing really good. Their numbers are really good. But then they come to class and they go, oh, my goodness, I'm saying this now. I, I never used to say that. And we'll put them in front of a video and, they'll, and, they'll, and we'll show them a video for two years ago. And they go, wow, I was better two years ago. And now I'm in a rush and I'm pushing people more. And, it's a. Uh, it's not like riding a bicycle. It's uh, selling service and uh, is quite a skill, and it has to. You have to maintain your skills and everything, especially like this. You need to invest in maintenance on yourself. Yes, <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. So, well, then, what are a few things a service advisor? Well, I guess we are kind of hit on this, um, or anyone for that matter. You know, should never say to a customer. You hit on the thirteen key phrases. Is there anything else that you might have that um, readers could check out? I know that you often provide some extra stuff with your columns. Is there anything else that you have out there that people could come to your website and check out real quick? Well, I think we've covered those, but two, two things I, I would do is never prejudge your customers. Or okay. I would say, never prejudge, and don't ever put a price tag on somebody else's car for them. I like that. I mean... My old car wasn't worth, you know, I might put more money into my new car right now than my old car, so that's a great, the prejudging. Well, then do you have any tips or exercises, resources that a service advisor or writer could utilize to better handle themselves, um, better handle themselves when addressing a customer in a professional manner, something they could try, you know, in those rare down times to really practice with? Well... Yeah, I'm glad you said practice because the first thing I'm going to mention is training. On sales skills, people skills, things of that nature, but more important in the training is the practice and the rehearse. And we just talked about being a pro. When you look at a professional athlete, a professional anything, how much time do they spend um, practicing their career or their craft versus doing? We're in a world that I'm going to sit here and tell you to be a professional, but most, don't, again, don't know what that really looks like. But pros practice. They practice their sales presentation. They practice utilizing features and benefits. They practice identifying customers' buying personalities. Um, they do practice the steps to handling objections. So I'm going to say training, practice, and please utilize that training. Um, now probably wouldn't be the best time to throw in that I know we have some of the best training in the world. But, uh, <laughs> you might uh, you do with that with what you will, but the one piece of advice I'd give to anybody is the practice, 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 and practice with others. Practice uh, closing techniques. Practice handling objections. Because the funny thing about with objections, most of these guys and gals, service writers, they do know the answers. It's their delivery that kills them. Practice the delivery. And, and the big thing is you can practice all day long, but uh, if you're doing it wrong, you may do it wrong while you're practicing. So years ago, we wrote this great article. I don't know if it's still on the Motor Age website. It was called Sales Management at the Front Counter, and we made CDs about it. And the idea was was to teach the owner how to help the service advisor see what they're doing right and wrong. Because uh, if you're doing something wrong, you know, like me using the word cheaper, unless somebody calls you out on it, uh, you'll continue to do it forever. So you really do need an owner to be playing the coach and listening to the service advisor and sitting at the counter and watching them interact with customers and just trying to be quiet, which is very difficult for most of us. Um, but to actually be able to hear uh, the stuff that's going right and wrong and then be able to correct it after the conversation's over because uh, there is a real science um, 
we had a, a three-day course on teaching owners how to sales manage the service advisor, mm -hmm. what to look for, how to how to look at the, their KPIs, not only from a metric and a profit standpoint, but suggestions that you can make how they're presenting the product uh, and the services and the maintenance to the customer. Um, sales management is really the final frontier if you want to get your service advisor kicking. And I think your December Motor Age article was mine about sales management. Not something you hear much in this industry. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. So that would be it. So if we did it again, yeah. so good. All right, then, just kind of to wrap up our conversation today, you know, let's go beyond now what employees are saying to the customers and look at how owners and management present the shop to the customer. You know, you, you highlighted it a little bit at the beginning um, when we first spoke uh, or started to speak. Why is putting forth a proper image so important and people, you know, knowing that you are a professional and treating you as such? Well... I'll start and you wrap up. Go ahead. Um, several different reasons. Um, expectations put on the automotive repair and service industry from other industries. So consumers' expectations today are out there. They're like never before. Um, for the dollars and cents that most have to charge today to be able to stay profitable and cover the cost of being in this business, that has to relate somehow that that the appearance of the place has to look like a million bucks. Not that you're charging, it just has to look like you're worth everything you're about to charge. Consumers, um, again, with so much bad information, they can't look at you as you're exactly what the industry or the image has been painted about the industry. Marketing dollars, there's so much money spent on marketing, so much time and energy spent on marketing, and how quickly that can be destroyed the minute somebody pulls up into your parking lot or walks through your front door. And we like to talk about the steps of the choreography of the business, that once you get a customer there, they found you on the internet, they found you some way, somehow, you better make sure that your choreography doesn't destroy all of that, destroy the image that's either been painted in their head or that someone's been looking for. And that's with the meet and greet, that's with the appearance, that's with phone skills. That's how people walk and talk around the store. And, and an example I like to use, and it's a pet peeve of mine, that I'm walking through somebody's place of business, about to spend my hard-earned money. People in the business won't even look at you and make eye contact, let alone say good morning, good afternoon. They didn't even acknowledge I even walked in. It's like I'd never even happened. It makes it tough to want to spend your money there. So when I know there's some things that you might want to throw in there for that one. Well, I hate, I hate the big counters. Uh, I think if we look at a lot of the modern car dealerships today, um, they're focused on trying to get the advisor and the customer at the same level. Uh, to get them close to each other, walking out to the car. The counter is like this big wall, and uh, some service advisors like to stand on the other side of the wall. And mm -hmm. the key to building a relationship is being able to shake hands with somebody. Uh, uh, women are fine with shaking hands, so they're okay. I, I think you would agree. And But you need to get out to the car, and, and I think the biggest message of professionalism is to slow down if you can. Get on the time. If you got the time and the shop's not weeded that day, um, take a walk out with them, look at the car, get to know them, what do they use the car for, who rides in the car. I think the more you know about a customer, it's going to be so much easier to help them invest in that car so they, they don't overspend in areas that aren't important to them. And some want to overspend. They love their car and they want it to look good and, and they want a service advisor to be paying more attention to those kind of things. So. The personality of the customer could be one of five different buying personalities, and, and it takes time to be able to, you know, to spend with them to be able to learn what's best for the customer, not necessarily the shop, but and that takes time. And I think, uh, you know, in Kim's article, which I think just came or may not even actually came out yet, uh, about how hard do we push a customer, um, I thought that was, that was a great article, um, and, and, and the, the point is, you know, what, where do you draw the line? How aggressive do you get with customers when they say no? Well, it depends whether or not it's a, you know, a maintenance item that can be put off or it's a safety item that's going to affect the family. And I think uh, service advisors need the time and need to know the customer well enough that they can get a little aggressive if they need to and say, hey, look, Shannon, you've been coming here for eight years, and I know you don't want to spend money on this, but the brakes and the suspension need work. 
and that's what we need to concentrate on first. And you got to have a relationship to be able to talk like that uh, without offending the customer, and that takes time. And don't forget that every time they walk in the door, you need to focus on that. You don't yeah. get too many chances. I agree. Two things. For the article that Chubby is referencing will appear in the August issue of Motor Age, so that will be out soon. Second, you brought up um, you know, the lower counters kind of you know, getting away from that. Just a follow-up question. Do you think that some of the new technology today, you know, there are programs out there from you know, service, you know, information provi service providers for your iPad, or for your Android tablet that people can now use and walk out straight to the car. Is that something that's going, you know, owners should invest in to help, you know, not only the technicians but you know, bridge this gap with writers and managers. Yes. Talk about looking like the pro. Yeah. It's the I hate new technology. <laughs> Brian's probably better at this than me. I hate it all, but you know, it depends upon the customer base. Uh, if you're in a neighborhood where you know you have everybody 65 and up like me, that's one thing. That's true. Uh, but uh, you know, if you're if you're in a younger generation area, they you know they that they're motivated by that. They they look at that. They want the speed, and they also wanted the relationship to exist through email, texting, or voicemail. Yep. And it depends upon what they want. You know, not not what the shop would like to deliver uh, to the communication in. It really depends upon every customer is going to be different. And, as the age group comes down, we have to uh, we have to react to it. In this younger age group, I'd want to be able to look online and look at my service history. Yep. I think the really cool things out there now today that everybody has a cell phone, so pictures and videos of things that maybe it's not easy to demonstrate via phone to Mr. or Mrs. customer. Shoot them an email or shoot them a text with a picture or a video. Talk about gaining trust and making sure they understand exactly what you're talking about. And there are some really cool tools today that do that. So, yes. All right. Well, Brian and Chubby, I really appreciate your time today um, having another little conversation with us. Um, thanks for your time, your tips, and I look forward to talking with you more in future months. Thanks, Shannon. Thank you for having us.